Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I'm the host and the producer of these chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today is Saturday, October 19th, 2024, and I'm finally sitting down to do an interview with Jim Maciel, who you're you're in Boston today. Yes. Uh, close enough. Close enough. OK. Okay. Uh, my title brother from IML is assisting us by enabling the computer technology, at least on the eastern seaboard for us. Thank you, Scott. We were supposed to do this interview in July, but the, yes. what do you call it, the aviation system had a great big hiccup. And so we delayed it, but I think it's going to be a great one anyway. So, Jim, tell us a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your family, your circumstances. Uh, so I am from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Um, basically, uh, if you do the old Cape Cod thing, I live in the armpit of Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. uh, well, lived with my mom and uh, stepfather um, and currently still live with my mother, who is going to be 82 this month. Great. Uh, so uh, we basically help each other out. I have an older sister who um, has two children. And um, for the most part, my family has been pretty supportive, my mother especially. Um, matter of fact, when I was 15, my mother was the one that asked me if I was gay. Huh. And I quickly said no at the time. But uh, so that quickly changed. <laughs> okay. Did her point of view on that change? Uh, no, no. My mother actually is the person who I've learned um, inclusivity and how you treat everybody um, for who they are and respect the differences that people have, and uh, which was quite the opposite of what my stepfather was at the time, who basically didn't like anybody that wasn't like him. So I had both gamuts of it growing up, and um, I was glad to have my mother's example. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, basically, she was very accepting and um, very inclusive. My mother's helped with my organization for many years, and uh, she's even continued to host our cookouts annually. Um, until recently, we just did it somewhere else this past year, but um, she was doing that since 2009. Um, and just, again, very accepting, very loving. If I like the person, then she likes the person. It doesn't matter. Wow. Okay, that's beautiful. You don't hear many people say that. Yeah, she's, she's, everybody calls her mom. Fantastic. <laughs> Does she wear gloves as well? Um, only when she's taking things out of the oven. All right. I'm not going <laughs> to touch that one. <laughs> But uh, you had a bit of a challenging uh, childhood, you've indicated, and you said abuse was part of that problem. How did you move on from that? Usually that's very dramatic. Uh, I mean, initially I started in New Bedford for the first four or five years of my life. Uh, when I moved to Dartmouth, I was immediately um, bullied and treated poorly. Um, this was second grade. And um, basically right up until my junior year in high school, um, I was pretty much bullied in school and treated poorly. I was even outed in front of my entire class um, during an auditorium thing where I was in a play and uh, several people held up signs calling me a fag and gay and um, which didn't help the bullying. Um, so it was quite, quite traumatic, but eventually what I realized was, is I just needed to be who I was and, uh, had to stand up for myself and which I did. And, um, by senior year, um, going from about 325 pounds down to about 165 pounds. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, I 
my life changed and I felt better about myself at that time. Um, so it was a matter of not accepting what people had to say about me, but figuring out who I was. And it was a very early age for me to do that. Uh, do I still have trouble with that? Yes, I do. How did you achieve such a dramatic weight loss? <laughs> um, believe it or not, I um, tried to ask one of the girls out in school to one of the dances, you know, trying to fit in. And um, I did it in my homeroom class and in front of her and the whole class I had asked her. Um, and she just screamed out. She's like, why would I go out with a fat pig like you? And I was horrified, ran out of the class. Um, Gosh. and from that moment on, I just really stopped eating, stopped, you know, had some issues with, um, uh, eating and, you know, getting rid of it after, <laughs> um, I did everything I could. So I, I went, it was a very dramatic weight loss. Yeah. And I didn't, it wasn't a healthy one. Definitely was not healthy, but. Wow. I, I can't help but, but comment in here. If the children were this young and saying such terrible things, that says an awful lot about who some of these people were in the community. Right. Incredible. I find it very odd now that, um, <laughs> Uh, some of the biggest bullies I had in school are actually now drag queens. Uh -huh. So um, I'll just leave that right there. <laughs> that alone says quite a lot, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Fascinating. Um, one thing I can say is um, most of the people that did bully me in later years, um, some of them actually made the effort to find me and to contact me and apologize Others I ran into um, and said that they were very, very sorry for how they treated me. Um, one was even like, how did you handle this? Because I have a child that's being bullied now and I don't know what to do. And um, so some of those things also helped with the growth. And I was able to just, you know, forgive and move on. And actually, some of them I'm still in touch with and oh. we chat with everyone as well. Wow. My my next question was going to be, were you receptive to that? Absolutely. I am not I am not one at this point in my life to hold grudges. I'm not one that forgets, but I do believe forgiveness is important, not necessarily for the person who's doing the act, but for myself to uh, be able to move on from it. That's a very strong statement. I can't say that I have that all the time. <laughs> But uh, so that was a very tumultuous time, a very difficult time for you. And I think at a very formative time for all of that to be going on. But you enjoyed gloves growing up. Yes. And, and because I failed at the beginning of this interview to indicate that you are with fits like a glove flag. I'll do that now. What was the interest in gloves at that time or if, in all time? I, I, I honestly do not remember a time where I did not like gloves. Um, I remember a kid watching the Westerns. It wasn't about necessarily about the Cowboys. It was about seeing the gloves, uh, the TV show Chips. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's just that opening alone was just, I was like, just be so excited and not understand why necessarily. Um, when I was a kid, uh, one of my uncle's, had gotten his license, he got his car, um, and he used to drive with driving gloves. Okay. And on Sundays, I'd go to my grandmother's house, and I, I mean, I must have been like six or seven, uh, maybe maybe a little bit older than that. Um, and he would take us for ice cream, the kids. Uh, there was a place up the street. So uh, once we got out, he would put me in between his legs, and he'd put my hands on the steering wheels, and then he'd put his hands over mine. And um, it was just an exciting thing for me. And even if he at one point like would <laughs> forget to get his gloves, I would run into the house to get them for him um, and never really understood why. Um, at the age of eight, 
my next door neighbor held uh <laughs> Thankfully, they're no longer with us, so I don't have to worry about any legal issues. Okay. But uh, they hung up a pair of work gloves uh, on their line, and I literally sat out there all day just staring at those gloves. And then late night, everybody went to sleep. I literally snuck through the house, through the basement, went across the property, grabbed the gloves, and for many, many months, uh, they were under my pillow, and I would actually just hold on to them when I slept and again did not understand why what emotions though that did that evoke I I felt excitement um I also felt kind of secure like security yeah. um it was uh yeah and then when I got into my um teen years and things started developing um um I realized that uh, it was kind of fun to do those things with gloves on and um, was very surprised at how that and well, it's kind of, I guess, continued on until even today. <laughs> My goodness. But not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wear gloves even in this interview? Uh, I'm not wearing gloves. Uh, interestingly enough. Get them. Uh, interesting enough, my fetish actually is to have somebody wearing the gloves. Oh, explain, so, please. Um, for me to be able to tactically touch um, them, you know, hold their hand, etc. Um, that's that's really the excitement for me. That's so, for me to wear gloves, it actually restricts that fetish for me. Fascinating. Yeah. So very, very specific. <laughs> yes. Uh, how do people react to that? Oh, um, I, just about every time I go out, someone's like, where's your gloves? Why aren't you wearing gloves? And I'm like, I don't usually wear gloves. Uh, but they assume because I am the founder and president of the organization that I wear gloves. I always have gloves with me, but I don't always wear them. That's fascinating. So most of the time, if I do, it's usually when I'm alone and we won't go into that. <laughs> now um is there any kind of specific type of glove material that you prefer over others or for me the important thing with the gloves is that they have to be tight hmm. very like skin to skin tight okay. so um i would have said initially it would have been black leather would have been the um attraction but then you know with the work gloves i really like those um latex as well uh, but it, it's got to be a tight fit if it's anything bulky or loose or it, 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 i lose interest and the no uh cutoff gloves no oh, half fingers that is a no-no for a glove fetish person i just feel like i'm i'm not knowing enough about this fetish it's so different for me that <laughs> so I'm a little challenged as to exactly how to elicit what I think an audience would like to hear. <laughs> most of most of what people who have a fetish, um, there's there's different factors to it. One is the visual factor, seeing somebody in gloves. Um, I I'm fascinated by somebody who is wearing gloves. You know, I.e. for example, wearing tennis sneakers and shorts and a tank top and wearing gloves is it, like it turns me on because it's like unexpected um oh, okay. you know somebody in full uniform and everything of course the look the power um with the gloves it's just an added um visual thing it's then also the tactical the touch being touched by um, some people like gom which is the glove over mouth oh yes yes okay some people like impact play with gloves. Um, that's not necessarily my thing, but I can understand the the feeling, you know. Uh, but touch is definitely a big part of that. Um, and a lot of it is kind of like a power thing. For me, especially, if someone is wearing gloves, uh, it, it evokes a powerful, uh, which for me would allow me to be a little bit more submissive or passive. Um, and that person would be more more in control with the gloves on explain that a little more what kind of energy and power is going on there 
Oh, uh, you know, whether it's domination and submissiveness, um, top to bottom, you know, daddy, son, whatever the the role is that that added power of the gloves for me gives me give that gives that more edge a little bit more of control i allow more to let myself go into their control uh, obviously consensually hmm. that is absolutely fascinating yeah, want to try it out sometime let me know well, appreciate the invitation. I mean, you never know when I may get out to the Boston area. But I, I'm I'm absolutely fascinated about how it evokes that kind of energy for you. Is there anything else fetish wise that does that for you? Oh, let's see. Um, I I like. Cock sheaths, cock and ball sheaths, kind of the same feeling, um, that second skin. Um, so that kind of falls into the, the, I think, with the glove fetish, you know, having your cock and balls covered, whether it be latex. I've seen some leather ones, and I, oh, my God, just so hot. Um, again, visual touch, that whole experience. Um some of some of the other things like cigars. I'm not a cigar smoker per se, but I do appreciate somebody um, who's wearing gloves, who's smoking a cigar. Again, that gives a like a little bit of a power um, domination kind of feel. Um, and there's many more uh, different fetishes that I do have. I mean, I could list. We could be here for a long time going into all of those, but a lot of it has to do with really um the power dynamic and touch and visual i'm a very visual person by nature so the, the actually seeing hmm. really is what a big turn on for me i don't necessarily have to participate you know by seeing somebody standing in a bar just you know or outside a bar smoking a cigar um that really can be a very uh, exciting thing for me fantastic i love it how were you introduced into more the leather fetish kink scene? <laughs> oh, um, most of my, my most of my start was through really Drummer Magazine. Okay. So when I found out that there was actually a magazine that dealt with leather and interests in leather, um, that was a big part. So early teens, you know, it was 16, 17. Uh, somewhere around um, it wasn't the internet. <laughs> uh, it, it basically, I, I had been talking to people because um, I used to go to one of the rest areas um, um, in Taunton, and um, I used to chat. It was it was just a place for me to go oh. where I could actually have conversations. So we would sit out. Um, you know, sometimes in the bed of somebody's truck or, you know, just tailgating and, you know, we would be sitting there chatting and talking and I talked to some of the, the older guys and they, I mentioned my interest in gloves and whatnot. And they're like, oh, you should check out this magazine and da, da, da. And then actually a couple of times they brought me a couple of them. Fascinating. Um, they didn't know how young I was at the time. This was like 17. I just got my license. So, um, so it was interesting to have that experience and then um, to be able to see this magazine and the one, the, the initial cover that I got, somebody was wearing gloves right on the cover. So that just got me. Um, and then after that, I, I tried to collect as many as I could when I was able to. You must have quite a collection. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I was interested, introduced to, Leather on a sexual basis with my first, I'm going to say boyfriend, for lack of a better term, um, who was a stripper oh. by profession. Um, and he was one that would wear leather all the time, 24-7. You know, we went out to restaurants. He'd sit there and he'd be eating with his gloves on. And if somebody oh. gave him a look, he'd be like, you know, mind your own fucking business. And, um, but, um it was one of, unfortunately, one of these experiences that fortunately ended in a very 
four way. And um, um, one of my most traumatic experiences, um, but uh, I've gotten past that. So I want to take a step back to the um, truck stop or the rest area, whatever. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the uh, location of too many fantasies and some great ones at that? Oh, yeah. Uh, what are some of your most fondest memories other than the conversations? Well, interestingly uh, enough, I wasn't one that went out into the woods that often to do the play. Um, I was still very, very timid shy and nervous about those things i'm not saying that i didn't do it but it, it wasn't it wasn't a high occasion like i went there every time looking for dick you know um for me it was the connection with people mm. like so i didn't feel like i was so out by myself and interestingly enough now i actually for my job go to rest areas and put condoms and lube in the woods and on the trees and so full circle <laughs> wow how did you even know to go to that particular rest area or whatever at that age uh again i don't know the specifics of who or what but mm. having a conversation somewhere along the way with somebody mm. um, mentioning that um again there was an internet really at the time so um i don't think i even had a cell phone I don't even think that existed. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was just uh, happened to run into somebody at some point in time who mentioned that these things occur. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And I, it might have actually been somebody who wasn't gay, could have been a relative or something like, oh, do you know what goes on in these rest areas type of a thing? And I was like, oh, <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, that's, I find that amazing, frankly. But, you know, however, at early on, wasn't it in your in your uh, exploration of all of this, you acquired a mentor, or they acquired you, uh, Mike Miller of uh, the founder of ABW. So um, Mike uh, now goes by Mick. Oh, Mick, sorry, M I K. Okay. Um, the basis of what happened, I'll, I'll briefly go into it. I started going to uh, the Yukon Trading Post in Providence, Rhode Island when I was 17. As soon as I got my license, um, again, networking, finding out from people, I knew that this there was this leather bar. Wow. Uh, I started yeah. going there. Um, then take step forward, you know, I turned 21 um, after I was seeing the stripper for a couple of years um sorry after after a very traumatic incident with this person um about eight months after that incident i found out that i uh, had hep b and i actually found out on my birthday so it was my 21st birthday and um i got very very sick for a period of time um almost nine months uh lost a lot of weight uh plus on top of that got pneumonia I uh, was very close to death My God. and survived, thankfully. Um, they were HIV positive, uh, but I did not get HIV. So um, I guess I lucked out in that that department. But so at the age of 22, I started um, starting to feel better um, and heard more about, oh, you should go to, you know, there's two bars in Boston. There's the 119 and there's the ramrod and i was like oh okay um so i ended up heading up there and one of my first times there um i was introduced to at the time mike miller okay and uh, i walked in wearing leather pants a vest a t-shirt and brand new white sneakers okay <laughs> and i walked through the door he took one look at me and he pulled me aside and he goes, I just want to say you look good, but you should never wear white sneakers with leather 
It's not appropriate. And this, you know, you need to get a nice pair of boots. Um, I was slightly embarrassed. Uh, almost ran out, but um, he started talking to me and just like, you know, hey, you know, the first time you're here, da da da. Um, the conversation went on for a very long time. He introduced me to a bunch of people. Wow. Okay. Um, it made me feel very, very comfortable. Um, Beautiful. Yes. And um, basically the relationship just continued on from there. Um, again, I very, very shy. Yes. Most people don't see that. Um, I still am. I still can be. But um, I have overcome that by just pushing myself to. So one of the things I did was I always said, um, anytime I go into the, a club or a bar, my only goal is to meet one new person, just say hello to them. And if they interact, great. If they don't, then I've met my goal for the night. And That's beautiful. Not enough people do that. And it worked. It worked. Um, I also at that time met Father James, who was also um, – James Collins was his name, uh, who was also a mentor. Um, unfortunately, we lost. I lost him very, very early on, um, but uh, another amazing man. So, but Mick, he just for some reason encompassed me into his community, into his. Um, so he he did things like East Coast leather and. Um, I think he did the initial uh, New England bear contest or a uh, bear contest, I'm not saying it. Um, I think it continued as New England bear after that. Um, he did several different types of contests. Uh, I know he did the American Leatherman, which I think then continued on to the American Brotherhood weekend. Okay. Um, lots of different things. And I, with my photography, uh, tied into that. So I was taking pictures of all of these contests. And um, so I got quite a lot of history. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah, this is technically uh, just turned 58. So this is technically now my 41st year active in the leather community. Incredible. Incredible. And not too many people can say that without, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. They can't. It's not not too common at this point. Yeah, um, right. they're in their seventies or eighties. I did start very young, though. Yes, and that's what's so fascinating about your history. Not many people really come into the community at that point. I find that incredible. Now, if you could pinpoint one or two main, uh, what do you call it, growth? challenges that you were afforded by Mick in this mentorship, what would those be? With Mick, I learned, again, kind of like from my mother, uh, the inclusivity part. Yes. Um, even though the titles and stuff were really male-oriented at that time, um, he was very inclusive in his how he paneled his judges, how he had people... Um, who were helping and operating with the the contests, um, with the events. Um, it was a connection of all the groups that were available. Um, there was no, no, sorry, you don't belong here with him. And um, that was something that uh, when I asked him, I said, so when I'm founding this organization, he's like, you want to have it so that everybody belongs and everybody can be a part of it. And, Incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, that was definitely one of the things. Um, he really taught me all about community, you know, and how to be active and how to be um, available. Um, I've been told many times now in these past, say, five or 10 years, how I've been a mentor to people. Um, and I'm sitting there going, really? I don't really see it, but thank you. But I um, actually just had someone the other day contact me and say um, that at this point in time in their life, uh, you know, it was like 10 years ago when they spoke to me and what I said to them changed their lives. And I'm like, and I don't remember the conversation. 
But I remember That's seeing true. the person and talking to them, but I don't remember. And I think it's just amazing that how one thing that you do or say could change somebody's life. That is profound. I, I find that beautiful and incredible, frankly. And it's, it's a nice, it's a nice feeling. Yes. Please. I had one guy literally uh, when I was in P-Town come up to me, he goes on August 11th, 1996, I went to the Ramrod and I bought a pair of gloves from you and I love those gloves and I still have those gloves. And I think of the organization and you and all the kind words and things you said to me back then. And I'm looking at him going like 1996. He knew the date. Wow. Um, so that's, that's amazing to me. And um, yet, and yet you feel somewhat nervous in a public situation. Oh yeah. I'm very <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of the things I've done in my life, um, I'm very surprised I've done. So <laughs> what's one example? Um, the numerous titles that I've won. Let's talk about that because I did want to. Um, started with 1995. That was the Mr. Brig. It was a bar title. Uh, we had this leather bar in little Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Um, which really was a surprise. Um, so I won that and was the one and only title. Uh, okay. 1998, I decided to run for the New England Drummer Contest um, and won that. I believe somewhere in between there, uh, might have been either before or after, I tried to go for the New England Bear Contest, um, did not win that one, and wasn't disappointed that I didn't win. <laughs> um, but... Um, and then uh, skip ahead further, I had some health issues, different things that um, had happened and got through that. And so right around 2004, towards the end of the year, I decided to run for, uh, or yeah, I think it was in 2004 that actually the contest was, but the title was for 2005 uh, for Mr. Boston Leather. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so... Drummer went on to the international drummer at San, in San Francisco. Okay. Um, Mr. Boston went on to the international Mr. Leather in Chicago. Um, I was actually pretty proud. I placed 13 out of 52. Great. Estes made top 20. Um, probably would have had better scores if I didn't overdo my speech. Mm -hmm. I missed the 90-second mark. <laughs> But um, I thought it was a pretty good speech, and considering I didn't plan it, and I didn't think I was going to make top 20, so I didn't prepare a speech. Incredible. Uh, but um, it was one of the most incredible experiences. And then um, 2014, uh, Northeast Leather was at the Eagle in Providence, and um, there was nobody running for the Sir title. And I literally got there on a Friday and um, they're like, well, nobody's running. Da, da, da. And I said, well, you know what? I'll run. So last minute I decided to run, figured, you know, at least to see if I can continue the title for another year, give them an opportunity to continue it. Uh, so I ran against myself, and which basically was against points. Uh, so I guess I made enough points. So then I had the 2014 Northeast Leather Sir title. Uh, which I get a lot of flack for because they're like, are you really a sir? And I'm like, I've been a leader in this community for many years, and I don't really th think that I don't qualify for that title. So good point. I kind of let people know exactly how I felt about that. Good. Absolutely. Yeah, we hear that all the time. But you mentioned IML and how definitive it was. <clears throat> what about that was so profound for you? Um, the fact that I could say, man, I would love a ham and cheese sandwich. And five minutes later, one shows up. <laughs> um, the fact that I had the support of, um, people like Scott Erickson and I had the support of a boot black whose name escapes me. Um, at the moment, uh, but she was 
fabulous. And he came out, Alex Bencourt. Um, and she came out on her own, of her own money, to be there to literally clean all my leather, my boots, everything. Um, wow. Every time I arrived somewhere, I had my entourage and everybody, all my contestants were like, well, look at Mr. Ballista Leather and his entourage. And it was, I love it. It was an amazing thing. It was not something that I, that would, that's generally who I am or kind of, but it, it, it felt kind of amazing. Um, and it was just really the love and support that I got. Um, you know, the profoundness of meeting people like Guy Baldwin and Chuck Renslow. Yeah. Uh, and um, I met Mama. Sandy yes. there. Um, and that was that was a profound moment because she literally got up on our seat and walked literally over to me out of a whole line of contestants and said how beautiful I was and how amazing I was. And she wished me the best of luck. And I was just like, I'm like, who is that woman? Wow. <laughs> and then someone told me and I spoke with her later and it just, you know. There was a lot of lot of love, you know, after the contest. And I, of course, I didn't win. Um, I arrived at my hotel and at the elevator and all the people that were along the side of the elevator were from New England and they were applauding me. Oh, how beautiful. I literally just broke down in tears. It was an amazing thing. It, it is. IML is different. And then there's that guy from Germany. Woo! <laughs> I don't remember who you mean for him, but yeah. Oh, uh, no one I'll never forget. <laughs> hey, there's always somebody, you know. <laughs> but let's get to the meat of this. Fits uh -oh. like a glove. Yes. Now, you know, there are people out there that can't wait to hear what you have to say about that. So tell us how that started. Well, um, Let's go back to Drummer Magazine. Hmm. Okay. Um, I saw an ad in the magazine about someone who liked gloves. And I was like, honestly, I knew I liked gloves. Um, I had been involved in the community uh, enough, but gloves were never mentioned. It was not a thing. Hmm. There was nothing out there about somebody who was like, oh, yeah, I really like gloves. Um, so I felt like, I didn't want to talk to people about it because I felt like I was the only person and I didn't want to feel like I was weird or a freak. Um, and this so when I saw this ad, I was like, Oh my goodness. So I respond three, four months go by and I'm like, Oh, I'm not going to hear from this person. And then all of a sudden I get a letter and it's from Pat Roche, R O C H E. Okay. Um, from Andorra. And Dora. Yes. There's a tiny little country between Spain um, and France. Yes. Um, My goodness. It's not even, not even big. I think Rhode Island's bigger. <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, and we just actually started corresponding, but he also sent me a list of other people he came across. Wow. That um, I was able to get in contact with. So I started corresponding with all of these different people all over the world right yes and most of them were um from all over the world the the initial members were pat roche um gary knights mark rhodes um gary knight was from michigan mark rhodes was from oklahoma um and i wish i had the rest of them in my head um there was a couple from england um, as well. So we had about six members to start and the membership actually came about really from Pat and I talking. He's like, well, we should, you know, kind of form some type of group. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was like, oh yeah, well, you know, let me, so I started going crazy and I'm like trying to think of names and, um, fits like a glove popped into my head. Uh, the acronym flag, uh, worked. I did, lo I did the logo, Yes. Next to me. Uh, so design I'm that. Try to move here so somebody can try to see. It. <laughs> and then recently, uh, two years ago, I believe, I did the um, the flag that's behind you. That is the glove pride flag. Oh, okay. 
Okay. So I figure everybody else got pride. Might as well put glove gloves into it. I agree. Uh, we have we have that as a um, as a new um, flag. So we have, um, and then I I just started to do um, correspondence and newsletters. Um, I did find out because I went back to double check. Um, I kind of been saying that it's started night uh, June fourteenth. 1991 but the actual first newsletter was june 19th okay so i don't know technically if we officially uh i used to say we officially started on flag day which is the oh, good point but um i you know if you go based on the newsletter i'm gonna have to say it's probably the 19th officially um but close enough i agree close enough to smell it <laughs> now how did you, what did you have to do to create this organization? Um, most of it was just really starting in with correspondence, reaching out. Uh, we started putting out ads to get other people interested. Uh, there was the Tough Customer um, magazine, which was uh, uh, the ad magazine that was off of, based off of Drummer. Oh, Okay. So I put a lot of ads in there, uh, Drummer Magazine. Um, and then, you know, from there, we just started building more and more membership. And it was kind of really fascinating to see that, you know, hey, I wasn't the only one. Um, the first meeting was actually held um, at Chuck uh, Matina's house, I believe. And it was in Dorchester. And um, we didn't even have bylaws set up or anything at that point. And this was actually... Um, after the newsletter, but when we started formally um, getting into the uh, organization piece and um, the bylaws were actually written on a shopping bag <laughs> as we didn't have any paper. And, uh, he, they cut out a, a literally one of those paper shopping bags. They cut it out and just <laughs> boom, so like a scroll. Yes, uh, and funny. James Collins um, was the one who, at the time, was the VP that we had voted in, and um, he was the one that wrote all the bylaws down as we decided. Um, we're one of the few organizations right now that is um, not election-based, Oh, okay. um, which is quite interesting, and I get a lot of flack sometimes for that, but um, we're 33 years going on 34. And if it's, uh, if it's not election based, then what is so it? I've basically been the president since the beginning and oh, I, I pretty much have appointed all of the office okay. uh, going forward. Uh, we did try a couple of elections without really any success. Uh, Nobody was interested in being elected or no one was interested in voting. So um, we <laughs> just, we just kept going as it is. And um, right now what we do bases on who's really interested in doing stuff. And uh, so uh, once we find somebody who wants to participate and wants to be a part of it, um, then we can assign them uh, specific board uh, roles. And um, it's been pretty successful. And you've just celebrated your 33rd anniversary, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, strangely enough, we do it in August. Hey. Best Best better weather. Tough weather, right? <laughs> but in that time, Flag has done quite a lot. What do you think have been the organization's biggest accomplishments? Um, well, uh, we just, like I said, just did the 33rd, but was also the 21st um, annual contest. So we oh. have a title holder. Uh, we started that in 2003. Um so we had initially the Mr. and Ms. flag contest. So we ran everybody against each other. Didn't matter uh, at that time whether you were male or female. Um, and you could electively take which, which title you want. So the first title holder was actually identified as female, uh, but took the Mr. title. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay. Um, and then we continued on later and uh, added Q for queer questioning. 
Fascinating. Um, and this year we added MX. Okay. Now we have the Mr. Ms. MXQ flag title options. And um, so anyone of any gender or identity, um, sexuality can enter the contest and choose the title of their choice. Fascinating. I, I, I really feel like we were one of the first contest to be that inclusive agreed um i don't know if there's anybody before us um we actually had a drag queen as a title holder uh one of our best title holders corvette i wow. believe she was 2012 um yeah so we we've had um just an array of many different types of title holders and it's definitely not based on the what the theme of people say when contests are beauty uh, contests. Um, it's really all about how we can take one of these people and for a year um, change their life for the better within the community, uh, whether it be someone with no experience um, and needs to learn something or whether it be somebody who has lots of experience, but really kind of needs to see a different side of it. That is absolutely fascinating and incredibly progressive, I think. Honestly. And all based on a very good mother. Yes, I'm a mama's boy. Hey, you're bringing her into the deal here. And I think that's incredible, too. Yeah. Um, Again, she was so accepting of everybody. Uh, it made it me easy to do. I don't need to understand what somebody is going through. I don't need to live what they're going through. All I need to do is respect it and accept it. Does the contestant go on to like a national contest? Do they do IML or something? Technically, I'm going to say that technically... Yes. This title is already an international title because we're an international organization, per se. I did not. But, um, most of it is based locally here um, in New England. I, I do get that. We have had one title holder uh, that was from D.C. Um, so uh, it's not a matter that we expect them to go on for something else. They can if they choose to. Okay. Would certainly support that if they do, uh, but we've had um, we had somebody who went on to become international Mister Death Leather. Uh, we had somebody okay. who's gone on to become Mister Boston Leather, and actually that title hold was also Mister Boston Leather and International Death Leather. Um, oh. Jack, what, which one of our most recent one, uh, he went on to become the New England Leather title holder uh, this year. Um, so they've they've expanded on their own. Not every title holder we've had has done mm. that, but they've had their own experience with it, and they've done what they can with it. And I appreciate the hard work they put in. Now, this has to be a source of incredible pride for you. Yes, yes, I'm definitely proud of. Uh, I'm sometimes ready to quit at a moment's notice especially yeah. after the weekend i'm like i'm never doing this again <laughs> but um and most people know at certain times of the year which is end of july before the weekend um try to be nice to me because i'm going to be very grumpy but um most of the time i'm, I'm pretty good about all of it well then i guess we should be grateful the interview got postponed till october <laughs> but um i somebody out there in the world somewhere is going to see this interview may what, i apologize in advance <laughs> what advice can you offer someone out there who is also ex uh, excited by gloves and interested in getting into this community um, well, I would say if you have an interest, fetish, um, something that just, you know, you can't stop thinking about maybe an obsession, 
um, reach out to people, talk to people, the, especially nowadays. It's so easy to go online and yeah. literally look up yes, so yes. much. It's out there. Um, that's something that wasn't available when I started everything. Um, and my thought is, is that if, you know, if they want to reach out and talk to me about anything, I have no problem with that either. Um, I'm pretty easy to find and I'm not intimidating mm. much. <laughs> um, but it doesn't necessarily even have to just be about gloves. It could be about anything. Um, I've had some very interesting people talked about different fetishes and interests. And I'm not, I don't want to really go into naming what they are per se, but, um, and I go, Oh, Oh, I, you know, I've never thought about that, but that's very interesting. Uh, may not be something I have an interest in, but mm. treat it with respect. I don't know how yeah. many times I have had people be like gloves. Well, that's weird. What? I don't get that, you know, and they, they talk down and that's something that we shouldn't be doing. Um, unless it involves doing something illegal or harmful to somebody, uh, non-consensual, you know, then that's where I would be like, whoa, okay, you're gone a little too far yeah. you know, on something that I can, I can, but other than that, I mean, if it's, you know, whatever it is, I don't have to be a part of it to respect it. And if you feel like you're the only one out there that feels that way, I can guarantee you're probably not. Agreed. Yeah. Now, I love to ask each one of my guests this question. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about you? Everybody thinks I'm a top. <laughs> everybody thinks I'm intimidating and, well, not everybody, but uh, I, I get it all the time. I actually just got it a few weeks ago. Someone said, oh, I've always wanted to talk to you, but you're so intimidating. Or um, I I was at the Mates Leather Weekend in, in Provincetown a couple of weeks ago. And um, this one guy literally was like, oh, sir, can I lick your boots and da, 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 da. And I'm like, well, I'm not really a sir. I'm really more of a bottom, but thank you. And um, he was like, but can I still lick your boots? <laughs> so I was like, sure. <laughs> Um, so I'm having conversations with people and this guy's right, you know, on his knee, you know, just licking my boots and, did he, you, up and he was very thankful and did you enjoy it? Sure. <laughs> You're not convinced, but okay. I mean, it, it, again, if the attention is drawn on to me, I'm not necessarily, you know, an intention seeker. So I kind of, I, it was a little, that awkwardness of like people now looking at me because of that was really kind of weird for me. Um, but I just, I did my best to just, you know, and they, it made him happy. Yeah. Made him happy. So I was like, hey, um, my big thing really for me is community. We're all one and we all are different. Yes. And it's okay to be different and it's okay to, um, you know, see different things, but appreciate that, that, that the differences are there and, and love the person or the people for that. Um, I'm so tired of going out and, um, having conversation, we'll, we'll go to have a conversation and they're like, I'm not interested or, Oh uh, no, or they, they just brush you off or, yeah. uh, you know what? That's not community. You know, if you're going to be out, you know, just because I say hello to you doesn't mean I want to fuck you yeah. or vice versa. Yeah. You know? And that I think going into that kind of a thing is what I want to tell. Just be kind, be respectful, um, love one another. Um, not everybody's going to be, great you know i have people that you know may treat me poorly um and i still do the best i can until i get to my breaking point to be as kind to them as possible um but if they re if they push me to my breaking point then i will tell them you know hey you know take a flying leap <laughs> <laughs> but um 
Yeah, I think that's the biggest misconception. I think people just assume that um, a I'm always I'm always busy because I'm running this organization and I'm a top and I'm intimidating and I'm actually really a very very nice guy that most people can get along with and um, kind of shy. You do realize you could take those attributes though and work them into a situation if you wanted. Really. Well, you know, depending on what you want out of something. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. You'll have to have to explain that one to me in a little bit. <laughs> I, I don't know. My lack of knowledge about flag makes me think I, I haven't done it justice in this. I hope I have given you an opportunity here to tell the world enough about this. I I am very proud of how far we've come, where we're at, where we're at. Um, it, to have somebody from Germany see me out in a club and go, you're the glove guy. Wow. Um, have people come up to me like that other guy and say, 1996, I bought my gloves. Um, Absolutely. It means something to somebody. And like, I'm hearing whispering. <laughs> so being coached. Um, uh, yeah. One of the IML judges did the very same thing too, talking about, you know, um, the organization and my, you know, getting gloves. And um, so uh, it, it's, yeah, for me, it's all really all about always, always been about community and just, accepting each other and um i think now um even at the providence eagle they have a sign up that says all who enter need to follow these rules and it talks about respect and kindness and um it's pretty amazing uh, and i think all the clubs should have that sign you said it you know um that's where that's what i think now how could someone locate you do you have a website or a Something like that? Uh, honestly, the best way to reach out to me is through Facebook or Messenger. Um, okay. That's usually the easiest. I have most access to. Um, they start from there. The website has been down for so long. Uh, yeah, that we don't have a web master. Anybody out there who wants to do a website for us for uh, zero dollars, we would love to hear from you. You, you never know. They're very like, well could be not a, a rich organization, and we don't, we don't, um, you know, we're not doing anything for profit. I mean, we do sell gloves, we do sell t shirts, membership, um, but all that money really just goes back into so that we can continue stocking and to do events. Um, so it's not really anything. Uh, and our title holders are the ones that do all of our, our, of our charity events and uh, raise money. We've had probably someone, you know, one of our title holders raised uh, approximately $20,000 for one organization. Wow. Um, Great. You know, it, amongst all the ones over the years that have done it, I mean, they, I would say at least thirty dollars or $40,000 worth of money has been raised uh, for different organizations, charities and stuff. Um, just through our title holders. And that's one of the reasons why we have them. Yeah. Well, Jim Maciel, on a, yes. an October afternoon, I thank you very much for this fantastic interview on Inside Leather History, a fireside chat for Fits Like a Glove. And I hope more people will be able to find you and participate. That would be amazing. So, I send you many leather hugs, and I thank you very much. And I thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out the Fireside Chat channel for more chapters in the history of leather. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe.